growing weary of running from room to room, practicing one-tooth insurance-driven dentistry? Then stay tuned for the latest episode of The Lionhearted, where Dr. Steven Rasner will hand you the blueprint for what many call the gold standard of general practice dentistry. Hi, everyone. Dr. Steve Rasner again. You're listening to The Lionhearted Podcast. Last week, I told you that we would continue what I thought was a really good episode And I told you, again, I'm trying to mix a little clinical for those of you that that's why you're tuned in. And with very relevant management, like how do you make this all happen type of information. So this week, let me reverse it. Let me do the clinical first for those of you that maybe that's why you're tuned in. And this week, I want to talk about two things. And this is going to be quick. What do you do with the extraction that you're stuck in? In other words, I don't know, maybe you tried my technique and you did it on a tooth that was really challenging. Or maybe you did somebody a favor like I have in my career. You thought you were doing them a favor anyway and you went to take a tooth out because they wanted you to take it out, right? And you're in there and you are stuck. Maybe it's just me, but I remember early in my career thinking, that if I start to extract a tooth, I have to finish because the patient will end up in a very bad way. And that's really not true. Here's what's true. If you find yourself in a clinical situation, as I just discussed, and you can't get a tooth out, whatever the situation is, uh, maybe you took the clinical crown off even, and you're just not getting anywhere, maybe 40 minutes has passed. It is not sacrilegious to abort an extraction, and they do not, I repeat, they do not have to go directly to the oral surgeon. And yes, it's embarrassing, it compromises your ego, but much worse would be keeping a patient in a chair for another hour only to then realize that you're not getting it out. And I, you know, if you took any of the courses I give, that is never going to happen because we teach a technique that's, you can get any tooth out, even long-rooted buttresses of buckle bone because they brux. History of root canal, it doesn't matter. I can, we know how to get those teeth out atraumatically. And atraumatically means We save the bone around the roots and we don't traumatize either the patient or ourselves. And it is traumatizing if you can't get a tooth out. You just pack the tooth up. Okay, I don't say the clinical crown's off, two thirds of the root structure still in the bone. No biggie. You have them bite on gauze, go home. In many cases, the oral surgeon may not even want to see them for a week or two weeks anyway. Put them on antibiotics and a pain med regimen and call it a day. I'm not kidding. i only telling you that because I didn't know that. And early in my career, there was a couple of occasions that I wanted to, you know, I prayed to the dental gods and the reg- regular god to no avail. Uh, and I, oh my God, if I... You know, it's 5.30 at night. Where could I send this patient even if I wanted to? You're fine. Just hearing that and knowing that is, I think, worth it. Let's talk for a second about bleeders. You take a tooth out and the socket just continues to fill up with blood and you're freaking. I know what that feels like. So how do you handle that? Here's what the mistake is that a lot of early experienced uh, dentist would do. They take gauze, they have the patient bite down, or they use your thumb and it's just saturating it and anxiety is starting to creep into the clinical picture. Okay? If it's a socket filling up, it's very, very probable chance that it's coming from a bone bleeder in the socket. So you, this is how you do it. Number one, you do use gauze, but you shove it into the bottom of the socket with one of your instruments like 
a Molt 2.4 elevator with pressure. The pressure from your thumb on top of the socket is insufficient. That's why it doesn't stop bleeding. So you would do that, and in a lot of cases, it'll slow down, but it won't stop. Okay, if that's the case, you should always have graft material on hand. And the two types of graft material that all you should have on hand is mineralized freeze-dried bone by any company you want. Most companies sell it the same way. They have a particle size that's specific that has been tested true and true, and it's usually a 50% mix of cancellous cortical bone. So when you hear mineralized a bone graft, an allograft from another human, that's really what you're talking about. I get mine from BioHorizons. I find them to be a, a just a superb company in all dimensions that I would now analyze a company. But you can get it from whoever you want. And then I use 30% mixed it with that of xenograft, which is bovine bone, and you can get that from whoever you want. I also get mine from the same company. That's a good mix if indeed you intend to possibly put an implant in this site. Okay, so follow me on this next and I'm going to get into these really important principles today. In that case, you have the graft material ready and your assistant has to be spot on. She pulls out the gauze, you put in the graft instantly and then again you apply pressure. The reason that's so effective if in your mind right now you can picture a socket and picture uh, an animation in your head of graft material filling in from the bottom up because it's really impossible sometimes to see where the bleed's coming from. When you do what I just said and you use graft material with pressure on top of it, firm pressure, what's happening is you're obliterating all spaces so the bleeder can't escape being obturated by you by the material that you just put into the socket. It's a very effective way. Now, I didn't get into soft tissue bleeders and using electrosurge, which is incredibly effective for that, as it is other bleeders. But for now, I just wanted to give you those couple tips. Let's get to the cornerstones. Last week, I was talking to you about just how annoying it is when you read, as I do, what you should be producing and how to produce more. And I have never, like I've been doing this 40 years, guys. I've never followed those, that thought pattern. What I did is I put in place these principles that we talk about, but I'm condensing them for you right now. Those that are relevant to this topic, meaning... If you follow what I'm telling you, you're going to produce a lot. And you're not going to have to worry about what you should be producing per hour or per day or per chair. I just find that taking the fun out of it all to talk like that. And, you know, with all respect to a lot of the management people out there speaking about these things, they mean well, and I get it. And maybe you're the kind of mind that would benefit from that thought. I'm not, and I know a lot of you are like me. So just do as many of these as you can, <laughs> and you're going to produce a lot. You know what my numbers are. They're ridiculous. I don't have any charts. Never did. Never have I had a chart anywhere. This is our goal for the day or for the week or for the month. It's kind of like training to be a superior athlete. When you train to do it, your outcomes are superior. Here's the review. Last week I told you, and it's not to be overlooked. You're not doing this alone, Doc. Everybody's got to bring their A game. Go back to last week's podcast if you want that review. Because it sets up the most pivotal moment, two moments of your week for new production, and that would be your new patient experience. And that would also be when you walk into recall. And go back and listen to how I talked about 
the preparation required by the hygiene team so that you can maximize what happens, what comes out of hygiene. You know, when I used to talk about the morning meetings, the I haven't done that in a while on these podcasts, I talked about what's really important. One of the things we used to talk about is who's in hygiene. And you've heard me talk about, for lack of a better word, the magic hygiene slip. So all my hygienist come into my room, and this is one that they religiously do. Wherever I'm at, they walk into the room. They have their name on the top of the hygiene check slip. If you don't have this, you should ask me to send it to you. And they'll have a review, any complaints, uh, new x-rays, last work talked about, but not done. So, and way more than that, I've required my hygiene team if there is a problem that we've known about. So how do we know that? Because when the patient makes the appointment, the front desk team is educated to now ask, are you having any issues? Are you having any problems? This prevents you from walking into a room blind or blindsided and doing free redos because you are in the middle of a million things and you blurt it out and you feel guilty or you know you want to appease the patient and you haven't seen them in a while. And look, and yes, sometimes it does require, if it's really complicated, a second consult just dedicated to what are you going to do? But a lot of times if you're prepared and you're prepared by a cheat sheet of a chronological review of what this patient's had, then you can make clean and good decisions. And back to the new patient exam, how you're ready for that, because everybody brought their A game, everybody did what they're supposed to do, patient was seen on time, patient was greeted the way you want them greeted, everything was fluid. Let me tell you something, when you do it that way, a lot of patients before you even walk in the room are already feeling the difference between this type of practice and what they have been to in recent years. And I want you to remember something. Even if you don't get the case on a new patient, it's fine. The goal is for them to leave feeling good about your practice. I don't get every case. And just, I've said this a few times, one of the things I find and hear myself saying that I like more than anything is when I sit down and get through the initial greeting, hey, welcome to the practice, guys. Now, they've already had their x-rays. Their significant other is sitting in a really nice chair inside my operatory that I purchased a few years back because we used to put them in a dental assisting chair and I was always afraid they'd fall out. I'm not kidding. And I've done this for so long. I said, what am I doing? Invested a few really nice chairs with wheels and nice backs. They have a lot of these chairs these days. So they're in that chair. And I hear myself saying after I say, where are you from and how did you find me? That's always how I start. And I'll say, listen, I want to tell you a couple things before I start. And their x-rays are already up in front of me. I haven't really looked at them. I said, I'm not here to sell you anything. That's not who I am. I'm not here to talk you into anything. Here's what I'm here for. I want to hear you. I want to hear what brought you to the dentist. Well, what, what's important to you? I want to look and see on your x-rays and clinically what I see. And then I want to educate you. I want to help make decisions so that you make a good one. And I'd rather you not make a decision to make a bad one. That's literally how I start. Me. The guy that just did uh, over six digits this week again. The guy that just had the best quarter of 40 years in Manhattan practice. And I've had other good quarters. I'm telling you, that's how I start. And it's not a trick, but it does have patients let their guard down. I can see it in their face. And especially me, you understand something. These patients in my community already know that they're going 
to an out-of-network dentist. They're going to a dentist that is not the Kmart of dentist. People don't go to me, and I'm proud of that, to save money. I mean, who wants to be that dentist? Oh, I am so busy because I am the most inexpensive in town. Really? I, I guess. You know, I don't know. Well, I'm going to actually get to that. So the next cornerstone is part of bringing your A game is you, Doc, bringing your A game. And do you have your case presentation skills down? Do you really have them down? It's a hard thing to teach, by the way. Some of it's not. You know, looking people in the eye like I'm looking at you right now. Talking slow. Picking up on their personality. There's four types of personalities. Look up the book, Non-Manipulative Selling by Alexandro. Non-Manipulative Selling by Alexandro. Somebody pointed that out to me in one of my lectures that I do. That I ought to read that because I kind of talk about it anyway. That's just four different personalities called a driver, a socializer, a thinker, and a relater. And you already know this, by the way. And people that are one of those personalities act and react differently. And it helps you. A lot of people, you can give the presentation of your life to a thinker. He's going to go home and think about it. Okay. The next cornerstone is to structure your fees appropriately. This is a big one and maybe too large to cover in one podcast. But listen, some of my patients listen to my podcast. And yet I'm going to say to you, I know my fees aren't low. Why would they be? Why would your fees be low? If your whole world was centered around being the best possible dentist you can be. Because that's what I did. And I know that's what lots of you do. You spend, you don't, you can't even track what you just spent on CE. You're listening to me right now when you don't have to do that. You're not on the golf course right now or on your boat. Maybe you are. <laughs> your fees should be commensurate, pardon the cliche, to your commitment to excellence. Why wouldn't they be? Why would you want to be successful just because you have the lowest fees in town? Or not even the lowest, average fees. Who cares? There's a market, especially now, more than ever, for people that just want a trustworthy, good dentist that really follows protocol when no one else, you know no one else is watching you other than your dental assistant. So nobody really knows how much you care about contaminating procedures by not following protocol. That maybe your crowns stay on better than the next doctor's because you follow Strupp, Bill Strupp down in Clear Flor Clearwood, Florida's protocols. And he is stricter than strict on how he does stuff. Nobody's watching you. You don't have to do that. You got your conscious as to make. Why would you be average fee if you follow things? I take so much time with my patients, as I know a lot of you do, that I can't, I wouldn't be able to stay in business. It isn't even about, I guarantee you that many organizations that watch me or don't watch me, that see 30, 40 patients a day, are probably more profitable. Good for you. My brother's more profitable than many sells vacuum cleaners. He probably can do it really fast. You know, part of being a lion-hearted dentist, I hope, is being proud of your outcomes, your clinical outcomes. So yeah, the fee thing is a lion-hearted gut check because it really takes courage. Because as soon as you raise fees, you're going to lose people and it hurts. It does. It hurts. I, I never got over it. And I don't think I'm alone with this. But what are you going to do? Try to appease everybody? Here's the problem with that. 
even if you're the lowest guy in town. Think about it for a minute. And your crown fee is, I don't know, let's just make up a number, $850, and you're average in your town. Do you really think most people think even $850 is low? They don't. It's just not how the consumer thinks, in my opinion. I think if you ask the average consumer, there, I don't know of a study that's ever been done, what a little thing like this, it goes over a tooth, should cost? 250 probably. So even if you're low and you go through your career that way, you got to have courage, guys. You got to stand for something if you're working for something to stand for. That's how I feel. So bring in your A game. Given a great NP experience, whether they do the case or not. Being prepared for recall. Structuring your fees appropriately. Quite honestly, getting paid up front. Every time I let that slip, which is hardly ever. Look, it's a little uncomfortable for me. I don't do it. My new patient coordinator does it. It's instinctive for me to be uncomfortable with dealing with that, so which is why I don't deal with it. I mean, we're a little flexible to some degree, but getting paid up front really means this. It's not, and I swear this is the truth of why it was born and why we maintained it for the last 25 years. It's because it requires a mental and financial and to some degree physical commitment by the patient to go ahead and finally do what they're saying they're going to do. When they tell you that they're coming in the first of next month or right after the summer and they have not paid for that, that is not treatment uh, case acceptance. So, you know, you only have the same thing I have. You have eight hours in a day to use these two hands. That's what you and I chose to do for our lives. And when you lose two hours because somebody changed their mind because there was no commitment, you don't get those two hours back. And when I'm at work, I'm there to work. I'm not there to watch the stock market or be on my phone. I'm there to do the thing I think I do best in the world, as many of you do. And then the last thing is to learn to schedule for your strengths. How I schedule is I schedule 9 to 9.30 is a lot of what, because I do a lot of surgery, is a lot of post-op evaluations where I'm required very little time. Then the heart of my, my personal production is either from 9.30 or 9 to, I would say, 3.00. At three, there will be something that I call non-productive. It's a patient I either chose to do that I'm not getting paid on, or it's a redo of something, and there's like one patient a day like this. So it's either just gratuitous, goodwill stuff. You know, I've been in practice 40 years. A lot of my patients now are up in their mid-80s, and, you know, their financial situations have changed. And, or even low productive stuff I'll do. I had a woman come in uh, this week. I did her smile. She, she loves us. And she broke off number seven after 16 years. With any other patient, I think that's an implant. And she was almost crying with the fear of what I had to tell her and so I'm you know in that particular case I am going to restore the tooth do an intentional root canal and that's really a minimal case and under the guise of non-pro not normal production so that's how I schedule and you need to schedule not randomly most of our wheelhouse of strength is the first five to six hours of a day. So uh, to me, it's certainly intuitive that that's where your production should be. I don't like throwing non-productive things in the middle of that. And I've learned to do it 
the way I've just told you. Guys, I hope this is helping. I really appreciate your emails. Really appreciate everybody that keeps downloading and tuning in weekly around the, the, the world, to be quite honest. Wishing you all success. Hope we can get together, as I, you heard me allude to a couple times, maybe with a live two-day lion-hearted thing coming up in the next year or two. We'll see. I got your back. I got your best interest. I hope you can feel that. See you next week on the Lionhearted. Hearted.